up, everybody? Welcome into it. This is the first installment of a baseball podcast. We're going to call it, wait for it, guys. It is The Porch with Luke Lipsius of AllQuest Baseball Podcast. Yeah, a lot of you guys were asking if we were going to have any type of uh, podcast for baseball season, and I was trying to work it out and trying to figure out the best way to go about it, and I thought about this. So once a week, typically every Thursday, I'm going to release The Porch. And um, it's going to be 20 minutes of me kind of breaking down the biggest news items of Tennessee uh, baseball in audio form and, of course, video form right here on YouTube as well. But here's the kicker. The last 15 minutes or so of each podcast, we're going to be joined by VFL former Tennessee first baseman Luke Lipsia. So really excited. I'm thrilled that he agreed to come on and join me every single week. And um, he'll be coming up here in the matter of uh, about 15 minutes. You'll get to hear from him. And I'm um, really excited about this, this baseball season. So again, this is kind of how it's going to work every Thursday, you know, give or take, it might move around a day or two, depending on the weeks under the first couple of weeks of baseball season, it is uh, going to be a little bit busy, but um, that's kind of my plan. So a little bit of me recapping what's going on right now. And then a little bit of Luke Lipsius talking about uh, what he saw from Tennessee baseball. So Luke coming up in about 15 minutes and uh, really excited to hear what he thinks of this new team. So appreciate you guys for hanging out with us here today, and you can follow Tennessee Baseball at VolQuest.com all weekend long. I'm going to be in Arizona, going to be covering the Tennessee Baseball team. We'll have uh, live game threads. Uh, we will uh, I'll have stuff on the front page, all that good stuff. We'll have video, uh, written content, so really, really looking forward to that. But the 2023 season, it's here, right? Tomorrow, Tennessee Baseball will begin play for the 2023 campaign. It's going to be out in Arizona for the MLB Desert Invitational. Tennessee will have three games, two of which will be broadcasted on uh, MLB uh, Network, but all three will be streamed at MLB.com, so you guys can check that out as well. Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, Tennessee versus Arizona. Saturday night, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, Tennessee versus Grand Canyon. Sunday, 2 o'clock Eastern Time, it is Tennessee versus San Diego. Let me double-check that Sunday time. Yeah, 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Originally, we had 3 o'clock, but it's 2 o'clock Eastern Time. It's Tennessee versus UC San Diego. And um, you know, really looking forward to that. I I'll have my weekend preview coming up. That's at... Uh, at VolQuest.com, that'll come up tomorrow morning. But um, it's some really good competition for Tennessee. We'll, we'll kind of touch base on, on what you should expect from each team uh, here quickly before we get to Luke Lipsius. You know, Arizona on Friday night, it, this is a Omaha caliber team. This is a team that j was receiving votes just outside the top 25 for the USA Today coaches poll. Uh, it's a team uh, in his second season with Chip Hale, 39 and 25 a season ago, 16 and 14 in the Pac-12, and, and it bowed out in the uh, Coral Gables Regional, did Arizona. But uh, they welcome back some really, really good players. Right-handed pitcher TJ Nichols, who I expect to get the start against Tennessee. He's six foot four record in 2022, uh, an ERA that was over five, but struck out 84 batters. His fastball sits in you know the upper to mid 90s. Slaughter ranges in the mid 70s. Um, he's a guy that uh, I think will will pitch against Tennessee on Friday night. Uh, but the guy to kind of look after in that lineup, if you're Arizona, is let's see here, Chase Davis. Chase Davis is uh, an outfielder for Arizona. It comes in at number 51 on MLB Pipeline's 2023 prospect rankings. He had 289 in last season. Drove in 18 ball or had 18 home runs. Drove in 54 runs. Had 13 doubles, 56 runs scored. Uh, Chase Davis is the guy that you will probably have to look out for in that lineup for Arizona. Also, shortstop Nick McClotry, 265 average last season, but had 21 extra base hits, scored 57 runs. He's a fifth-year shortstop for Arizona uh, that has captained two teams to the NCAA tournament and one team to Omaha a couple years ago. Trevor Long is a pitcher that Tennessee will likely see if the game is close in the back end of the bullpen for Arizona. Uh, he had a 6-3 and three record with seven saves uh, last season. So uh, Arizona, its offense is really one to kind of watch. It kind of pops a little bit. Uh, D1 Baseball projects Arizona to be a, a, a regional team. It was picked to finish fourth in the Pac-12 this year behind Stanford, UCLA, and Oregon. Uh, it's, it's an offense that is going to be – Upbeat. It's an offense that Tennessee will have to look to kind of stop, but uh, still, it's it, if, if you're going to slow down anybody, it's Chase Davis, who is the Golden Spikes Award watch list guy and a unanimous All-American. Uh, he is the guy for Arizona to kind of watch out. 
So Arizona comes up on Friday night. Then we go to Grand Canyon. And Grand Canyon, actually, it's interesting. It's the only team in this tournament that is hosting a game in its own ballpark. So it's kind of like a disadvantage, but still, it's really good early in the season because Tennessee is going to be away from, or is not, is not going to be away from Lindsey Nelson Stadium for like a month after this, right? You come home, you play the midweeks, you have all these non-conference games. I mean, I think it's something like March... 15th or something maybe before Tennessee or that series on my birthday March 12th after that is when Tennessee leaves uh, Lindsey Nelson Stadium for an away game so it's it's gonna be a minute really and so it's really critical to get a true road game experience out of the way and so Tennessee will be playing at Grand Canyon I'm not sure if that's how they got Grand Canyon to join the field Grand Canyon was a little bit of a late add to this tournament but still they will be hosting Tennessee on Saturday night Grand Canyon First season with new head coach Greg Wallace, 41 and 21, 25 and 5 in the WAC conference. Uh, they had a regional appearance at Stillwater a season ago. Um, Chase Burns will be the projected starter for Tennessee with Dolander projected to pitch. Uh, Dolander will pitch against Arizona on Friday night. So it'll be Burns against who I think it'll be a Southpaw and Connor Markle, 6 and 3, 543 ERA um, a season ago. So uh, more on Markle. I'll go ahead and start there. I say it's going to be him because sophomore Daniel Avidia was the preseason WAC Pitcher of the Year. So I would imagine he's going to get the nod on Friday night as their number one guy. But still, you know, Markle is a guy who ranked in the nation's top 100 for strikeout to walk ratio at 75 to 17 last season. Or if you simplify that, 4.41 strikeouts to one walk. So Tennessee's going to have their hands full with this with the crafty Southpaw and Mark or in Connor Markle. Uh, who I'm expecting to get the ball for Grand Canyon uh, on Saturday night. You know, Tony Vitello kind of said it best the other day earlier this week. Grand Canyon's a team that just wins a lot of game and no one really talks about them, right? They were picked to pick to win the WAC for the sixth straight year. Um, they won four of the last regular season conference titles for the WAC. They were an at-large bid last year in the NCAA tournament. They did fall to Arkansas and Missouri State in two outings in the Stillwater Regional. Uh, let's see here. The club was 41 and 21 overall, 25 and five in conference play. I mentioned that, uh, D they ranked inside D one baseball's top 25 for each of the past three weeks in the regular season. So I told you about the projected starting pitcher. The guy to look out for, for grand Canyon is shortstop Jacob Wilson. So Tennessee has chase Dolander, who's an absolute stud and who ranks as the number two prospect for MLB. A uh, pipeline's draft prospects. Ahuna, Maui Ahuna ranks number 22. Jacob Wilson ranks number nine in terms of Ma Major League Baseball MLB pipeline's draft prospects. Number nine. He is named the preseason co player of the year for the WAC. He was stabbed as preseason All American by five different publications. He's a Golden Spikes Award semifinalist last spring. He only struck out, get this, guys, only struck out seven times in 246 at bats. That was fewest in the nation last season. Uh, he led the team in hits and doubles and batting at, or second on batting average, all that type of stuff. So Jacob Wilson for Grand Canyon is an absolute stud. Let's see here. Who else in that lineup is somebody to kind of look out for? Uh, let's see here. Utility player Elijah Burries. Um, he received preseason All-American or All-Conference nods. He's a versatile player. He might play first base, might play second base base might play left field he was the only gcu player to appear in all 62 games last season he was a freshman all-american he ranked third on the team in batting average and walks and hits and doubles so um that is somebody to look out for as well that offense kind of pumps it a little bit it's a good all-around team really it's got an offense that returns a lot um it's got two pitchers that headline their weekend rotation and again i do believe it'll be tennessee seeing the lefty connor markle six foot or six and three last season with a 543 ERA. All right, let's go and talk briefly before we get into Luke Lipsius here in a couple moments about Sunday's matchup, Tennessee against UC San Diego. I think Friday night will be challenging. I think Tennessee will be challenged on Saturday night against San Diego or against uh, Grand Canyon. I think Tennessee can win those games, but I think it'll be a little bit challenging. Um, I think Tennessee can win this game against uh, UC San Diego by 10 runs if it wants to. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but hear, hear me out here. This is only the third season for UC San Diego in Division One baseball. So already playing behind the eight ball there. Third season in Division One baseball. Um, this is also going to be their fourth game of the tournament on Sunday. So pitching for a team that is not projected to be too good on the mound this season, 
their pitching is already going to be run through by the tournament time, by the time Tennessee gets to them. And so I don't even know who's going to be their starting pitcher. It's not, it's not even out there right now. And I only got information on a couple of their starters or projected starters, and they're going to be throwing Friday, the two games Saturday, and you know Tennessee likely won't see them. But what we do know is Tennessee's Drew Beam will square off against Eric Newman uh, and the head coach at UC San Diego. So this is this is his twelfth season uh, as 2023 begins. But it will be Drew Beam who was eight one, two seventy two ERA uh, a season ago, the th- the th- one third of the three headed monster for Tennessee in the starting rotation. Um, more on UC San Diego, 24 and 32 last year, 13 and seven in the Big West. Uh, the Tritons were picked to finish eighth in the Big West this season. And again, like I said, only their third season of Division One baseball. A couple of names to look out for: uh, senior third baseman, shortstop Jalen Smith, also could play a little bit of outfield. He was preseason All Conference. He led the team in slugging percentage, on base percentage, and was second in hits last season. Um, let's see here, catcher. Emiliano Gonzalez is also a name of a guy that's probably potent in that lineup. Uh, he led the team in average and drove in 18 runs, scoring 19 runs himself. So it's an offense that returns, I believe, about six starters in that lineup, but the arms are are just not very good. There's not a lot of arms there. Right-hander uh, Ryan Forsuni and lefty Zach Ernest will likely get the ball the first two games of this series. Tennessee could see Michael Mitchell, six foot five, two hundred and forty pounds. Uh, he missed all last season, but had a four and one record with a three point oh oh ERA in twenty twenty one. Tennessee might see him, but he might pitch before even the Volunteers uh, get over there on Sunday. So uh, if so, he does have a fastball that sits in the low to mid nineties. He also has a slaughter and a changeup. So potentially, Tennessee could see. Michael Mitchell. Uh, Tennessee would likely probably see Isaac Martinez um, out of the bullpen if it's a close game. Um, he's likely to close some games. A three and two record and a three ERA back in 2022. And they also have a Southpaw and Ryan Rosas, who Tennessee could potentially see that as well. So that's a little bit of a scouting report. I'll have a more in depth written piece again coming out tomorrow, kind of previewing the weekend. And that's what you had to look forward to tomorrow in terms of getting ready for the MLB. Desert Invitational. All right, just a couple of minutes left before we get into Luke Lipsius. Um, interviewing him, asking him what he thinks about this team, this lineup. I kind of go almost position by position to get his thoughts or position group by position groups. But uh, Luke is a guy that's been there, done that. He spent six years here at the University of Tennessee. He knows this team. He was a part of uh, all the accomplishments this team has you know, had over the course of the majority of Tony Vitello's tenure, but of course the last two years have been really, really special. So Luke knows. He knows for sure, and um, we're going to get into him here in just a moment. But uh, what I'm intrigued about this weekend, quickly, is I- I'm thrilled to see this what the batting order looks like because I think that there's a couple different options. I think Maui could lead off. I think Christian Moore could lead off. I think Jared Dickey could lead off. Um there's so many options for the heart of the order. <laughs> There's so many options. Um, you just got a lot of batch, right? So, you know, where's Maui in this lineup? Is he leading off? Is Christian Moore hitting sixth or is he towards the top? What exactly on Sunday when Griffin Merritt finally gets in that lineup? Remember, I put the note on the board yesterday. Griffin Merritt is suspended by the NCAA for the first two games of this tournament because he was ejected after the final out of his last game with Cincinnati last year. So by NCAA rules, he won't be able to play. He's got to sit out two games. He'll be in the field on Sunday. Frank Anderson, Tennessee pitching coach, also serving another one-game suspension, carried over from his ejection against Notre Dame in the Super Regional. So, you know, once Tennessee gets its full cast of characters on Sunday, kind of where's Griffin Merritt? Is he three, four, or five? Um, is Blake Burke hitting three? You know, Jared Dickey's tearing the cover off the baseball right now. Uh, Kyle Booker, when he's in the lineup, I feel like it's going to be towards the bottom of the order now. He was a potential candidate to lead off, and I think him or... Christian Scott will be at the bottom of the order. So, um, of course, uh, along with whoever's catching, likely Charlie Taylor to start things off, but we will see Cal Stark. I'm intrigued to see that batting order, that batting lineup. I'm intrigued to see what the outfield looks like. At full strength, I think it's going to be Griffin Merritt in left, Kyle Booker in right, and Jared Dickey in center. As we know, um, that's not going to be the case the first two games of the, uh, of the weekend at least. So, will we see... Kyle Booker still playing right because he has the strongest, stronger arm, or will we see Jared Dickey slide to left? Maybe a combination of of Christian Scott and uh, excuse me, Kyle Booker and Christian Scott in left or right field. Where do the freshmen come in? The uh, the Dylan Drylings and the Reese Chapman. Uh, there's a lot of intrigue, and we're going to see kind of how that plays out. But we will see a lot of players play this weekend, 
And we're likely going to see a lot of pitchers, again, because you're playing three straight games. So, And if you don't see who you want to see on the mound, don't wait. Don't fret. Uh, you have two midweek games coming up on uh, on on Tuesday and Wednesday. So uh, really looking forward to it. It's going to be a blast. Uh, again, I'll, I'll be down there. I'll be covering it all at underscore Kaner. And, of course, find me on VolQuest on the general quarters. I will have you guys covered for Tennessee and the MLB Desert Invitational. All right, without further ado, let's bring on my guest for this podcast each and every week here on the porch. We're going to be joined by Vol for Life, former first baseman Luke Lipsius. Luke, man, what's going on? It's uh, it's it's got to be kind of a different time for you, not getting ready for a new season. But I know you're excited to watch the Tennessee baseball team. What do you what have you been up to? Um, yeah, you know, first of all, uh, I'll say. It. It's definitely weird. Um, I got the almost preseason jitters. I guess it's just something my body's used to. Uh, but no, I'm super excited to be watching them. Um, I know they're going to have a great year. But I've uh, just been working on finishing up my master's, hanging out, uh, applying to jobs. You know, it's it's not the coolest stuff, but I'm I'm really excited. You know, to get my life moving forward. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's um that that's an exciting time of your life for sure. But I know it is it is bittersweet. Uh, you know, not playing the game you love anymore, and, and certainly. Uh, when you look at the Tennessee baseball team, man, I think that um, I don't know if it'll be 57 wins like you guys did last year, but I think this team will win a lot of games uh, kind of from the outside looking in. Now, what do you make of this team? Where do, how, how good do you think this team can be? Yeah, well, on paper, they can be as good as they want. You know, um, they're preseason number two for a reason. Um, they got so much talent across the board. That staff is so deep. And then they got so many good young and uh, some experienced hitters that lineup and so on paper they can do whatever they want um it's just putting it together with leadership and their team chemistry that's really going to tell how good of a season they can have um so it's going to be up to them to decide if they really want it or not Um, they got some pretty big shoes to fill i hope that doesn't bring on too much pressure for them i think they'll be fine the way coach v runs the team but i mean i I think they're gonna have a great season Uh, that offense really only has to score three runs a game you know to win Mm -hmm probably by a pretty good margin, you know? Um, and so it's it's going to be good. Uh, that's the way we felt last year, that the offense didn't need to score much. The staff didn't need to pitch all that well because the offense was going to get their back. So it's like we were putting up 12, they were putting up zeros, and it just it rolled. And so I think they have the the ability to do that this year too. Luke, uh, let's let's look over to, to what you call home, the other hot corner at first base. Um, you know, you, you played that spot for Tennessee for for, for a long time, and uh, a guy that likely you know would have played on a routine basis last year if you weren't there for your sixth season uh, due to COVID would be Blake Burke. Um, had a really good fall. He's had a really good spring. He's now going to be the everyday first baseman, and it, it was to a point last year to where his bat was it was an everyday bat because you just couldn't you, know, you couldn't not hit him anymore, right? Uh, what do you like about Blake and his ability to play first base? And kind of now it's it's his time to kind of step up with you gone. Yeah, well, I like the um, stature he came in with as a freshman. Most guys you see coming into that position specifically as a freshman, they don't have good feet, they don't have good hands, and you kind of got to work with them. Blake came to school um, basically as a junior, not not just hitting but also fielding. You know, he's, he has such elite feet – uh, for a big guy, he has great hands, um, and so I'm I'm really excited to see what he can do. It's it's basically if he if he locks it in every game, he'll be just fine. And then of course the bat's gonna come, or the bat's gonna be there no matter what. It's it's kind of not kind of it's really fun to watch him hit those balls and just know he got it, you know. Uh, but I I'm really excited to see what he does at first base, and then around the rest of the infield, uh, the way we train him, he he shouldn't have to be making too many crazy plays. So I'm I'm really excited. You know, it was it was compared during a broadcast last year of um, of his swing looking like King Griffey Jr.'s, mm-hmm. um, uh, and that, that that's a pretty high praise. Would you say that his swing might have been the best, su- sweetest swing on the team, or would you say it was somebody else? His swing is just so nice. It's one of those swings that looks slow because it's so fluid and through the zone. You know, uh, when in reality, it's it's so fast twitch, and he can get to whatever he wants. Um, but as far as sweet swings go, it's it's hard to beat him. I mean, Gilby's got that nice toe tap, but as far as just uh, start to finish, his swing is is something else. <laughs> well, you you look around the rest of the infield. It, it's kind of incredible. Um, again, I don't think offense is going to be an issue for this team. However, 
you are replacing pretty much every defensive player. I mean, I know Jared Dickey was out there and left a little bit before his injury, but you're pretty much replacing every defensive player, which is just incredible. Um, you look across the uh, the infield, and you got Christian Moore there at second, who was a, a routine bat in the lineup, and now he steps up for Jarrell Ortega. And then you go to the transfer portal, you get Maui Ahuna at short and Zane Ditton from Alabama at third. A new look infield, but uh, really a lot of experience and a whole lot of talent, especially at that shortstop position for Tennessee this year. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, the experience. Um, you worry with one of these teams where you got a lot of people going, who's going to fill the shoes. The good thing for us is Simo has had reps at second. He's had plenty of ABs. I don't think the pressure is going to get to him. He's a quality infielder, uh, very athletic, can make a lot of plays. And then, and then he got a Hunya, which is just a stud. He reminds me of Ricky Martinez, who is our current infield coach, in the way that he plays defense. Um, just makes every single play and makes it look easily. And then he just zips it over to first, you know, right in the chest. Um, and then he's got that experience, too, being a junior, which is awesome, even though he's had, hadn't had reps in a Tennessee uniform. Experience is experience. And then you got Zane, who's been, who was at Alabama for such a long time. Uh, he's a great guy from what I've heard, which is awesome for the team. Everyone has got his back. And he's another experienced guy at the hot corner, you know, and uh, he'll make every play. It seemed like against us, we couldn't get one by him. So having him on our side as opposed to on, on the other side is going to be really nice, too. Man, sidebar. I mean, of course, you know, you know, we we all play sports growing up. I played baseball, you know, through high school. Love baseball and everything. Of course, I didn't play it at a high level, but I mean, I, I played a little third base. Like, I man, I know the hot corner and everything. But my God, like I was, I was over the field the other day uh, for for a media thing, and I went out there and I stood at third on the turf, and I'm just sitting there. I'm like. You got to be insane to play third base on this turf field. I mean, that's I mean, you, you talk about hot corner times ten plus turf. My goodness, man. I mean, it's you got to have quick reflexes over there. And, and I feel like you know, last year for you guys, Trey Lobescomb was such a pleasant surprise. He was so good. And so, so to your point, I think it's really good to have a an experienced guy in Zane Denton, not only in the play but also in, in the field. He's going to be one of Tennessee's better infield defenders. Yeah, 100%. Uh, with the turf, they, they prepare us just fine. Elander gets up there and he hits at about 110 at us short. <laughs> so we're used to that. Now, when it rains, it's more just like, yeah, we'll, we'll get our bodies in front and see what happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you, you definitely have to have some some gusto to play the high corner. Man. All right, let's go to the outfield. Um, lo losing some some hard guys like yourself, of course, Jordan Beck, Drew Gilberts, and, and then Halvey over there in, in left field. Um, it's going to be kind of an, an interesting group. Um, you, you, you bring in Griffin Merritt from Cincinnati, who was the AAC player of the year. Um, and, and he seems to be, you know, joined and, and mixed in well with the others. He's going to be a regular at one of the corners. Um, you're going to have Jared Dickey playing somewhere back there routinely. And then you have some elder statesmen and, and Cal Booker and Christian Scott, and, and then the influx of two new guys who are going to play and, and, uh, Dylan Dryling and, and, and Reese Chapman. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag back there. It's good to have options, but again, you're replacing a whole lot of talent from last year's roster. Yeah, 100%. And again, um, you do bring in some experience with Griffin, and then you have experience in Dickey, Booker, and C. Scott. Um, so as far as outfield's concerned, you know, uh, V and Bonnie, they have the guys training every single day. They have them doing the right things, um, really learn how to play. And so I think it's going to be a battle of who's going to hit. And so... Everyone is basically on the same level as far as defensive skills go. C. Scott might be just a touch ahead with his speed uh, and has a great arm too. But as far as that goes, I think it will be a battle of who can hit. And then as the season goes on, you know, people will start making plays, being good defensively, and everyone will settle in. Uh, but that's the way it is at the beginning of the season. If you hit, you're in. And if not, you're out. Yeah. How was um, so Christian Scott? He is doing exactly what you did. Christian Scott and Cannon Sewell this year doing exactly what you did a season ago and taking advantage of that COVID year, staying for another year. Um, kind of what, what I, I know you didn't make that decision for them, but kind of like what's your mindset when you are the older guy staying back and, and kind of going for. I don't want to say a victory lap because I mean, like you were, you were there, you contributed, you were a major part of that team. So like, it's not like you just didn't play or anything, but like staying there another year, kind of getting a gift, an opportunity to keep playing. Um, I feel like that's something that Christian Scott and, and Scott and Sewell are really trying to take advantage of the most this year and trying to come up through in a big way like you did. Yeah, 100%. We both know they're going to be really big contributors. I just hope that they do realize 
to enjoy it. You know, it's it's hard, especially as a baseball player, the way the draft is set up, getting drafted junior year. You don't really know when your last year is going to be. And so for them, they know this is going to be their last year. And so I hope they can just take a step back, uh, realize what they've done and how good of a career they've had, uh, enjoy it and just take it all in. Because that's one thing that I changed from my first few years to my last year is I just I really enjoyed it. And so one took a lot of pressure off me. And two, I was having the most fun I've ever had playing baseball. So if they could do that, I think they're going to have a lot of success and they're going to really enjoy this year. Plus, it's going to be a fun year, <laughs> just period. So Griffin Merritt's going to be, um, I put a note on the board the other day, and it's I mean, it's kind of, it's common knowledge, really. I mean, if you know, if you follow baseball, he was, he was ejected after the last out of his game against Cincinnati last year. So he'll be sitting out the first two games of the season. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what the, what the what what that outfield looks like, whether it's you know Jared Dickey, who I think is going to see a whole lot of innings in center field. Potentially, Dickey will play left. You'll have Booker and right, and and C Scott in center field. Maybe those first two games, or or whatever the case might be. Um, but Jared Dickey, center fielder. Um, I, I talked with him a couple of weeks ago, and I was kind of like center field really he's like yeah man i'm fast <laughs> i was like uh, okay like what do you think about dickie playing center field it seems like that is where he is he is it might not be his every inning spot but it looks like he's gonna play a lot of center field this year so dickie has one of the craziest stories at tennessee because he came in about 250 wow. and it wasn't it wasn't a very strong 250 either you know i love the kid and i hate bagging on him but the the transition he made from the what was it the spring of 2020 to the fall of 2021 or maybe 21 to 22 was he dropped about 40 pounds and then got ripped and so with that he also got fast and so he, he showed up to campus that fall uh, he was running great he looked great and everyone's like holy moly just blown away um and so yeah everyone knew he could run by springtime and so i guess he's he's kept on and, and gotten faster um but i think anyone trusts him in the outfield just the way he plays almost like a, a gilby in that he's not afraid to run into the wall he's not afraid to, to really go get a ball and he's got the speed and his routes are good so I, I don't see any problem with with putting him in center yeah he told me that uh he, he really reads the ball well off the bat and you know, depth perception and that, that's what an outfielder is and so if you can do that you got the speed to track things down then you're, you're going to be just fine but i'm excited to see him out there play center that's for sure uh kind of speaking of him a position that he was repping all fall long i mean he was doing he, he wasn't doing outfield at all really it was catcher um mm -hmm. and it wasn't until this spring when he kind of started getting uh back in the into the outfield but uh, behind the plate it uh, looks like uh, dickie will be available if needed but looks like it's going to be more of the charlie taylor cal stark with with a ryan miller there and needed maybe ryan miller is a, a de designated hitter and pinch hitter he's got a nice bat uh it seems like charlie taylor's come a long way and i know that it was really critical for him to step up and and get some live reps under his belt on the stage of the NCAA regional last year in front of a you know packed house sold out crowd and and games where you guys won in the playoffs yeah, no, that experience is completely invaluable. And I still remember uh, he laid down that bunt in the regional game and Instagram the next day posted a picture of him with the bunt and the caption was just the bunt. And so he's one of those guys that he didn't come in much, but when he did, he was a fan favorite. And so I think that's going to be a, a big thing for him is knowing that everyone has his back. And so he can kind of let the pressure roll off. But yeah, that, that catcher spot, is a little bit of a question mark. So Chuck is undoubtedly the best defensive catcher we have. However, is his back going to be there? And so again, I love the guy, but I, it, it really is about who hits. Uh, in the catcher spot, there's a little bit more leeway because having a good defensive catcher is invaluable, especially when you've got power arms like we do, you know? Um, so I think Chuck will be the main guy behind the dish, and I, I would love to see him. Uh, figure it out at the plate. Um, I know I'll be rooting for him as well as all of Knoxville. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you talk about fan favorite. I mean, it's it's like that guy could do no wrong last year, and mm -hmm. you know, standing ovations and everything. I mean, and and again, credit to him. He didn't hit, but he came in, played great. You know, a backstop and and working with the pitchers and everything. And again, it was that stage. It was, it was you know, it was postseason baseball. So you know, credit to him. I'm excited. He had a good fall. He had a good spring as well. Uh, with, with, or a good uh, you know preseason as well with the bats. So 
excited to see what he can do. Uh, I'm going to save the best for last here in a moment, but let's talk a little bullpen right now. Mm-hmm. Tons of options coming back for Tennessee and some regulars. And, you know, you got the Kirby Connells and you got the Cannon Sewells, which is huge. And, you know, Seth uh, Halverson seems to be healthy, and that's going to be just incredible for Tennessee in terms of how they can use him. But uh, some new guys who uh, have joined the party and a guy that's been on campus but looks like he's uh, just now going to – uh, to, to get his opportunities, Zach Joyce, younger bro- or brother of uh, Ben Joyce, and then Andrew Lindsay. I don't know if you had a chance to see any of these guys, these new guys throw or anything, but kind of when you're looking at the you know who's who, what do you make of the Tennessee bullpen and the options that that Frank has? Yeah, so it's it's a typical Tennessee bullpen. You know, we we're going to be deep. We're going to have guys that can run it up high speeds. We're also going to have guys that can just get you being a good pitcher. You know, um, but every single time I ask, how's that bullpen? How's the pen? How's the staff? Andrew Lindsay's name gets brought up a hundred out of a hundred times. Uh, the guys talk so highly of him, even being a freshman or a transfer, right? Yeah. So he he played at Charlotte in 2021, That's didn't right. play anywhere last year, went and played Appy League this summer, and now he's here. So yeah, so just transferring coming in, they <laughs> everything I heard is mid 90s with some run, throwing cutters and sliders. Um, they just tout him so highly. So I think he's going to be a key piece late in the pen and now halverson is the guy that i have starred ever since he's been making his comeback trip because that guy he's a psycho like blade tidwell he's going to get up <laughs> on the mound going to want to run it through somebody um and so i am so excited to watch him i'd expect him to be a long relief guy to start and potentially work into a starting role at some point um and then you got guys like zach joyce who of course is a really good, really good arm. He doesn't throw as hard as Ben, but who does? Um, he's got a little bit more control. He's going to be great out of the pen. But yeah, that that staff is so deep, so many options for Frank, which is going to be so crucial uh, throughout the weekend. And then, of course, when you get into tournament play, when you're playing more than just three games, um, so they they're they're poised to make quite the run. And then, of course, you got the starters, the three headed dragon that no one can score runs against. So it's they're they're yeah. going to be just fine. I'm sure Frank is licking his chops. Um, ready to get out there and and you know we're gonna throw strikes we're not gonna walk people it's gonna be really awesome all right I mean everybody knows how good Chase Dillander is Chase Burns Drew Beam um, you know we know the preseason accolades the postseason accolades last year all that type of stuff but as a guy playing behind those guys you know in the field you mentioned it earlier we were like we can just go out there and do our thing and we know that you know if we score three runs we're probably gonna win by th- you know probably by three runs right <laughs> I mean how how I don't want to say easy, but how nice is it to play behind those guys? Because you know pretty much consistently what you're going to get every single start. I mean, uh, in terms of embarrassment of riches, um, it's pretty incredible what Tennessee has in Dolan or Burns and Beam. Yeah, no, it's uh, the first thing is that they throw strikes. So as a defense, you never get out of the game. Uh, a lot of times if you have a guy that can be kind of erratic, it's harder to focus because he's throwing balls, he's walking people, whatever. These guys will pound the strike zone, so that means you always have to be ready for a ground ball, whatever. Um, luckily for them, they strike a lot of guys out, giving us not as many opportunities. But it, it was always like, we got your back, you got ours. There was never any blaming if someone, let's say, made an error or something bad happened. And it again, it just goes back to the pressure. I knew that the pitchers knew that we were going to have their back. They knew that, or we knew, or they knew that we were going to have their back. We knew that they were going to have our back <laughs> into the zone and stuff. Um, and so it's just, it's a great dynamic, and that infield is going to be fine whenever people do put balls in play. You, know, you said it a moment ago when talking about uh, Seth Halverson, you're like, you know, starting out long relief, and then he'll eventually potentially transition and start some games. Well, like Tennessee had four starting pitchers last year. It's a long season. And, mm-hmm. and by the time you get to the end, you're not protecting those freshmen anymore because they're not freshmen, but you do want to protect the arms and maybe, you know, skip a start here, skip a start there. Hopefully there won't be an injury, but maybe there will be. Um, you know, Seth Halverson can do that, long relief. He can spot start. Camden Sewell started the uh, – remind me, right, it was the SEC Tournament Championship game against yep. – Yeah, yeah, against Florida, right? So, you know, having Halverson, having Andrew Lindsay who can do that as well. Uh, of course, having Camden Sewell – yeah, Tennessee's in a good position. All right, a couple minutes left here, um, and I appreciate it, man. I'm 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 super thrilled that you're going to do this with us every single week. About 20 minutes with you and talking Tennessee baseball. The stage Tennessee has coming up this weekend uh, at the uh, MLB Desert Invitational, formerly the MLB Four Tournament. You've got really good competition. Tennessee's playing Arizona tomorrow night, Grand Canyon at Grand Canyon on Saturday. 
and then UC San Diego on Sunday. A lot of good competition, a lot of good players, some some prospects who are going to be in this tournament. Um, how big of an opportunity is it for Tennessee to be able to start the season off against this quality competition kind of away from home? Yeah, well, the first thing is they're going away from the winter and they're just going to enjoy Scottsdale. You know, that place is awesome. They're going to be in the heat. They're going to soak it all in. Um, like you said, the competition out there is really good. That's a new – or it's an Arizona team with a new head coach. Um, so every, all eyes are going to be on them. Nobody knows what they're going to have. But, of course, they're going to have really good players, play good baseball. Um, and then San Diego and Grand Canyon are going to be great. Grand Canyon had quite a year last year playing them at home. Going to be tough for the Vols. But I think this weekend will really set the stage um, and answer questions that we've all been wondering, you know, like how are we going to do with such a – uh, so-called un- inexperienced lineup, you know, playing in orange. Um, how are we going to come out? Is our pitching staff really that good? You know, all these these kind of Twitter questions will get answered. But I think the way that, that V runs things, no one's going to be feeling the pressure. Everyone's going to be enjoying it. And there's going to be a lot of passion. I just, I can't wait to see what they have out there, you know, especially, I can't wait to see Blake Burke hit with that, uh, that Arizona, that Arizona wind and, and sky, you know, those balls are going to fly. Yeah, yeah, I'm jacked up too. Plus, I mean, I've I've got many questions about this order. I mean, I know I've got a list on my notepad here, and it's you know guys, you know two four six or one you know one two three or you know five six seven or one mm-hmm. seven. You know, it's like okay, I want to see depending on the matchup, kind of kind of this order figure it out itself because there's there's some options there, especially at the top. I mean, you've got like you've got Jared Dickey, you've got Ahuna, you've got you know christian moore you've got you got a ton of guys who can at lead off too so all right man last thing i got for you here today give me a prediction about this weekend someone can do something over the course of a game maybe it's jared dickey going eight for 12 over the weekend maybe it's dolander pitching seven shutout i don't know give me a give me a prediction for this weekend so my hot takes i think friday we're gonna come out win pretty handedly Saturday is going to be a close one, and then Sunday we're going to win handedly. I think Dolly is going to go out five innings, seven Ks. Um, I think Lindsay is going to close two of the games, so I'm, I'm guessing Saturday. No, I think Lindsay might close one then. Um, and then I think Burke will go two homers. Dickie's going to go seven hits, and then the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, that all happen. Tennessee better come back with a with a clean sweep, right? Three and oh. Exactly. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Hey Luke, man, awesome stuff. Appreciate it. We'll do this again next week when we look ahead to Tennessee's weekend opponent. All right. Appreciate it. For sure. Thanks so much. Forward Tennessee first baseman Luke Lipsius. Awesome stuff here. And really, really happy that he decided to join us uh here at VolQuest.com. Hey, first edition of the porch with Luke Lipsius, a Tennessee VolQuest bot a uh, VolQuest. Tennessee Baseball VolQuest Podcast. There we go. Uh, I'm Eric Kane. So glad that you guys have uh, elected to hang out with us here today and check it out. Uh, We'll do it again next week as well. Don't forget, Tennessee Baseball gets the season started tomorrow in Arizona against the Wildcats, Saturday against Grand Canyon, Sunday against UC San Diego. I will have complete coverage all weekend long. I'm going to be there. And uh, you can check it out and check it out and follow it over at VolQuest.com. We'll have a game thread on the board. I'll have major takeaways as soon as the game is over. I'll have video uh, with the coaches and players, all that good stuff. So if you want coverage of Tennessee at the MLB Desert Invitational, you can follow me, as always, at VolQuest.com. Appreciate you guys. If you're heading out there, have fun, safe travels, and uh, we'll touch base again next week about Thursday as well.